Hi everyone, it's 7.05. We won't waste your time any longer. I'll start. And before we begin, we'd like we I would like to remind you again, if you have any questions, you can ask them at this link over here. Scan the QR code or fill in this link. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Ho Chi and with me is Tong Cheng, the only other person whose camera is on. And we are gonna be our instructors for today's workshop on spiking neural networks. And before we begin, we'd like to introduce MLDA at IEEE. So MLDA at IEEE is a lab dedicated to anything related to machine learning and data analytics. So the lab aims to allow students to learn and apply technical skills while connecting to like-minded individuals and industry leaders. So the lab therefore hosts a wide range of activities ranging from deep learning to regular workshops, which is open to all students. In this workshop, we'll first be going through some of the theory behind SNNs before jumping into a hands-on activity. So for the theory segment, we'll first give you an introduction to SNNs with a brief overview of the history and motivation behind SNNs. After that, we'll look at the biological nature of SNNs and how they are implemented. And following that, we'll look at the future of SNNs in terms of applications, limitations, and research potential. So after that, we'll have a short break. And after the short break, we'll diverge from the theory and move on to a hands-on activity. So here we will be implementing, first implementing a neural network with PyTorch, as well as a SNN architecture with SNN Torch. And at the end, we'll have a brief Q&A session to answer some of your questions regarding SNNs. So as mentioned earlier, we'll be having a hands-on session. So having a decent grasp of Python and some libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow would be beneficial. However, this is just to ensure that you have the best experience throughout the workshop. And it will still be friendly to most participants. And also additional resources will be open to everyone at the end of the workshop once you submit a feedback form in case you are unable to follow through during this workshop. We hope that through this workshop, you'll gain a few takeaways so that it doesn't really become a waste of time for you. Uh, first of all, we hope that you would understand the motivation behind SNNs and neuromorphic computing. And also you should be able to identify the differences between artificial neural networks and spiking neural networks, as well as understand the concept behind spiking neurons, encoding, and optimization. Of course, through the hands-on session of our workshop, we also hope that you will learn how to implement an SNN for image classification. So we'll first be looking at an introduction to SNN. To understand why we want to delve into the development of neuromorphic computing and spiking neural networks, we must first understand Moore's law. So Moore's law is an observation that the number of transistors in a dense, indicate, dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. And this actually represents the speed at, at which processing speed is increasing. However, there have been claims that it's now the ends of Moore's law or that Moore's law is dead. So it's true that we are reaching the physical limits of what we are able to fit into microchips. However, there has been a lot of research that has been done in two fields to try to surpass this physical limit. One of which is more well-known, which is quantum computing, which utilizes quantum states to perform calculations. Quantum computing is highly powerful and is used in some areas due to its security and speed. However, there are challenges in, regarding quantum computing, and other than these challenges, quantum computing is also geared more towards large-scale computational problems. So on the other spectrum of small and low footprint computing is neuromorphic computing, where we are trying to mimic biological architectures in computing systems. Neuromorphic computing is efficient and flexible, and is therefore able to rapidly change its method of responding to events. So our focus for today will be on neuromorphic computing and its software implementation, spiking neural networks. 
So, first, I'll be going through a bit of history regarding pneumorphic computing. And it started with, it's widely believed that Carver Mead was the first person who introduced pneumorphic computing to the world. So together with Hopfield and Feynman, he developed things like neural networks, pneumorphic engineering, and the physics of computation. And since then, there have been even more re regions of research and implementations of pneumorphic engineering transition from analog to VLSI, also known as very large scale integration, where there are millions of MOS transistors in a single chip. More recently, pneumorphic computing has become more prevalent and talked about due to the booming popularity of AI and the use of neural networks in them. So due to the greater interest in AI, different forms of neural networks are getting more attention and work being poured into them. And spiking neural networks are one of the beneficiaries of this AI boom. So when we talk about spiking neural networks, they are commonly referred to as the third generation of neural networks after the perceptron and deep learning. However, what makes them different from the earlier generations of neural networks? So if we look at the earlier generations of neural networks, they would usually look something like this. And right here, this is a simple diagram of a multi-layer perceptron, which is a form of deep neural network with an input layer, some hidden layers, and an output layer. The neural networks typically used in a deep learning is usually more complicated than this with much more hidden layers, but this should suffice as a simple demonstration for you all. Uh, what happens basically is that information will propagate from the input layer through some hidden layers to the output layer via a process known as forward propagation. And from the output layer, an error is calculated with the final output and the correct result. And we try to, and based on this error function, we try to adjust the values based on the pro process called back propagation. When we look at an individual neuron, it takes in some weighted input, passes it through an activation function, and passes it out to the next neuron, or as an n value, as a single output y. However, if we look at biological neurons, they don't actually work that way. So in biological neurons, the way neurons communicate is by forming synapses, like over here and then sending information through electrical signals, which exist as spikes, like this. And so our original neuron, which is used in the neural networks, is very far from how biological neurons actually work. The voltage graph at the bottom right shows how the spikes are formed, based on ion channels opening and closing and allowing the diffusion of ions through them, and therefore generating the spikes as we can see here. So after this, I'll be passing my time to Chong Chongsheng, who will be elaborating more on spiking neurons, encoding and optimization functions, as well as what spiking neural networks can be used for. Sorry, Chongsheng, you're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, hi everyone. So thank you, Hochi, for the explanation of perception and deep learning approaches. So now we actually move into spiking neural network, where we actually take in information in the form of spikes and then uses those spikes as kind of signals to propagate through the neural network before we get an output. So this is very different from what we have been doing in the previous approaches. So to start, we can first look into the neuron itself. So if you look here at the diagram, this is how a uh, typical neuron in a spiking neural network looks like. So on the leftmost side of the figure, you can see an input spiking neuron. So based on the data that have injected into the spiking neural network, you actually have produced some spikes from this input neuron. And this will be weighted and having a bias, just like what we have done in the previous perceptron, and then inject it into another neuron, which will produce more spikes. So if you look over here, this is an example of a fully connected spiking neural network. And then you have 
it's very similar to what we have seen just now for perception, but I think the main difference that you can all observe is that the fact that these are now using spikes instead of like X and Y values, which are kind of binary or analog values. So this actually leads to the characteristics of SNM, which are its sparsity as well as its event-driven properties, which are important, especially when we talk about low power computation. So in terms of the mathematical models which can produce this kind of spice, there are actually three main common models as shown on the screen, namely the Hoxkin Hoxley model or HH model, the Ichika batch model, and last but not least, the Leaky Integrate and Fire model or LRF for short. So all these three models are kind of different in the ways that the, the mathematics actually explain how the spice are being produced. And out of all these three, the LRF model is actually one that we will focus our attention on today, especially in the practical session as well, due to the fact that it is the simplest out of all these three models. And at the same time, it is able to kind of mimic the biological neuron in its spikes production. And this is important if you are talking about efficiency, because the simpler the model, of course, the simpler the computation and it will actually lead to a much more efficient algorithm at the end. So we can look into the leaky integrate and fire model over here. And you can see the red one actually represents the neuron. And you see there's a circuit below it. So whenever we try to make a model that explains the neurons, we typically look at circuits model because they kind of explain or able to mimic the behavior very well. And this, in this case, the LF model, you can see that as there's more and more stimulus to the neuron, you actually add on to uh, generate a pulse where the membrane voltage, as you can see in red, will slowly increase. And then you actually, at the same time, you will slowly decay due to the kind of the interaction within the neuron itself due to the resistance as well as the capacitor as shown on the circuit. However, as you increase and increase more and more of the stimulus by having more and more of this great pulse input, you see that the membrane voltage will slowly increase to the point where you touch the membrane voltage threshold. So this threshold value, once it's reached, you actually produce a spike before you actually return the membrane voltage back to the resting potential. And then you actually exist as a refractory period where no more spikes will be produced. And then after that, only after this period, your pulse could actually affect the membrane voltage again. So now this may seem very complicated. When you look at the right-hand side, it's actually the mathematical model. But if you break it down further, it's actually quite simple because it exists as a first order differential equation as shown on the top right, whereby you have the parameter which include the time constant of the membrane, which is affected by the resistor as well as the capacitor as shown in the circuit. And then you have the du dt, which is the change of the membrane voltage equals to the membrane potential ut and the resting potential u rest plus the resistance of the membrane as well as the current that's passing through the neuron. So if we write this into the in terms of the membrane potential, you see that we obtain the resting potential added, added with the other terms on the right. So by using Newton method, you can simplify this to make it more easy in terms of implementation, which is by using ut equals to the previous membrane voltage plus the du over dt, which is the change. And over here, if you break down the current, it is actually into three different currents component, namely the synaptic current, the noise current, and last but not least, the injection current. So how we actually inject or process the data is actually one way is to do this injection current, whereby if you imagine an uh, image such as what you're looking at right now, you actually made out of a lot of pixels, and each pixel is a form of value and data. I can use that data and convert it into an injection current, and this will actually produce spike when you inject it into a neuron. Other than this, you can think that the biological neuron doesn't really work in this way, in the way that they process data. Instead, how you do is what it does is that you actually encode all the data and information that we 
obtained through our senses and encode it right into spikes through spike encoding scheme on the screen shown here. So there are three common ways to encode the spikes, namely the red coding scheme as shown in A, the time to first spike in B, and last but not least, the internal spikes interval scheme as shown in C. So these three are some of the common spike encoding schemes. And we can look further into the, each of them in details. Each of them actually have its pros and cons in this implementation, but you may ask like, why not we use all of them together? Or like, how come there are different encoding schemes? Because the fact is that neuroscience is kind of the, one of the key drivers behind the field of sparking neural network. And we still do not exactly know how the biological neuron actually encode information. And it's an on current process and research areas that's currently going on. So if you look at A, to zoom in into A, the red coding scheme, what it says is that you can set a time step of let's say 10, and then within that time step, how many spikes are being produced. And in this case, you see that there are five spikes. And then you can get the rate, which is in this case, just five over 10, which is 0 0.5. On the other hand, the time to first spike is just really, as the name suggests, it is the time where the first spike occurs. And last but not least, the ISI is just what is the interval between each of the spikes. And then we can do some manipulation with that. So when we look into the, when we compare them, if you are talking about speed or like how fast this computation can go into, it actually, the one that will perform the fastest is actually B, because you see that we are just taking, once a spike occur, we straight away we have the value and then we can output the value. On the other hand, you have to remember that if you actually just take purely the time of the first spike, noise can actually affect how the encoding scheme is going to encode the data. That's why in this case, if noise is very important, you will want to use the rate coding scheme, whereby you are just finding the rate and then other noises will just affect it, but not as much as the TTFS scheme. So that's actually how the neural network actually encodes the data into spike and use it to input into a spike neural network in a biological brain. So now that we have learned how the neuron works and also how they can encode data and inject data into the spike neural network, what we want to know next is how do we optimize it? As what Ho Chi discussed previously in kind of the previous implementation in perceptrons and deep learning approaches, we're always trying to optimize it using some form of loss function and then trying to reduce that loss. So over here, we can see this diagram actually represent how the optimization can be done. So the orange line or orange curve actually is the loss function. And all the further iteration, we are trying to reach the minimum. So as mentioned, we are trying to reach the lowest loss that is obtained for the neural network. It is done through commonly through stochastic gradient descent or SGD with back propagation. So what it does is that you input the data into the neural network, it propagate forward into the neural network and if I have an output, we find the output and compare it with the actual value during training. And then we find the loss and then try to reduce it by back propagating throughout the whole neural network again and try to minimize the loss through the adjustment of the weights as well as the bias or any other parameters that are involved in it. So it actually requires a function to be differentiable and convex. But if you think carefully, what we have explained just now is that when we talk about spikes, they are actually discontinuous. So as shown here, we are actually using spikes. So these are actually discontinuous. So we can't really do this SGD with backprop very easily using SNN. And it's actually one of the research areas for SNN as well. Some potential solutions that we propose in research, they can be classified into back propagation variants, or also a supervised learning, or the unsupervised approach. So in the back propagation variants, or one of the supervised approach is actually using the surrogate gradient learning, it's very popular. And how it works is that if you look at the screen here at a graph, we have the loss as well as the kind of initial and final value of the position. And when you talk about spikes, Having an impulse function, you obtain a kind of a gray value as shown on the graph. 
which is discontinuous. However, if you actually use a function to approximate it or smooth it, you obtain the purple line as shown. And this is actually differentiable and convex such that you can do your back propagation with it. On the other hand, we also have an unsupervised approach as mentioned. And one of the most popular and uh, hot topic in this area is actually the spike timing dependent plasticity, STDP. Because if you think about how the human brain or the biological brain works, is that we realize we do not really need supervised approach all the way. We can learn things on our own through unsupervised approach as well, through experimenting and then trying to, based on the data, we get rid of some inference. So this flexibility can be imbued uh, SNN through STDP, which is why it's very popular. And how it works is that as you can look at the screen, the graph, you have A and B, and these two actually shows when the post spike as well as a pre spike occur. The post spike and pre spike are kind of spikes that we produce from two different neurons, which could be connected together. And then if the pre actually happened before the post, this is actually what we call a potentiation. We have the increase in your width because it means that, all right, this information of this neuron connection is important. We want to increase the width and in the biological world, this means an uh, increase in the strength of the synapses. On the other hand, if the post occur before the pre, you have the reset happening or depreciation. You know? This is where your weight is being reduced because it means that the synaptic, the synap the synapses which are being uh, formed might not be that important, so we can actually reduce the weight. So this is actually where the kind of flexibility and adaptability of uh, SNN actually comes into play when we talk about it. So this is actually highly popular, but what we observe is that when we want to implement this, it's actually very computationally heavy based on what we are having in terms of like hardware as well as the software implementation. So this is a challenge to make it uh, more efficient. And also the performance, when you compare this to either both of these backpropagation variant and unsupervised approach, it is kind of still not comparable to deep learning approaches, especially those very deep network. Those are very accurate and the SNN might not be able to achieve that, especially when we are focusing our attention on efficiency. So at the same time, other than these two approaches, there are also other approaches such as the weight transfer, or conversion of the weight and the network or through self-organizing apps, which could actually potentially help SNN in the future. But uh, these are some of the research areas that are being done through, uh, happening right now, and all needs to be done still. In our practical session later, we actually look into the surrogate gradient learning as the way to implement the SNN. And it's on, I will also share about why this is actually popular at this point in time. So other than the limitations that we have talked about just now for SNN, it is a, still a very highly viable option to go into, especially if we talk about low power and uh, high efficiency application. So other than that, when we want to simulate the brain, the SNN is very important to kind of use it to, as a model to understand the human brain or the biological brain. So actually, as neuroscience develops, we kind of better understand the human brain and we can better implement uh, SNN. And that in itself actually allow us to better achieve algorithms that are more accurate in terms of this modeling of the human brain, which kind of works in both ways as a feedback loop. So other than that, you see that the efficiency as well as this adaptability is very important in various applications such as your satellite image processing. As shown in figure three, this is actually the camera that was sent into space that uses a neuromorphic sensor with SNN as its core. And then we also be using for especially for bio signals and bio kind of wearables devices. Low power efficiency is important. And at some points when we talk about interaction with the nervous system, the SNN might be used due to this close resemblance of how the biological brain works. And yeah, as mentioned, we have the age devices, the automobile processing units are is also a hot topic or hot field of application that SNN is being used. So in figure one, this is actually the Intel Loihi 2 chip, which was released not long ago. It's a new neuromorphic processor that can 
actually utilized the SNN and more specifically the LF, LIF SNN. And figure two is a HIDA neural processor, which is a startup, it's produced by a startup which actually works on uh, neuromorphic computing and SNN. Other than all these, we also have some big companies which are doing this, like Intel, IBM, Qualcomm, ASTAR, and some research institutes. So one of the first few kind of actual neuromorphic chips that uses SNN actually comes from Qualcomm with its zero processor, but that was very long ago and it didn't really reach a very high success. But uh, over the years, the area of neuroscience and hardware and as well as the AI field, as mentioned by Hochi, has grown tremendously and that has actually enabled more and more development being done in this area of SNN as well as neuromorphic. So what is next for SNN? It can be summarized into three different areas, namely the algorithm, the architecture, and the application. So for the algorithm, as mentioned, you always want to try to reach a comparable performance with the deep learning approaches that we saw previously. So this could be done through the optimization problem or even new forms of algorithm to augment the SNN that we talked about just now. On the other hand, when it comes to architecture, it could be in the form of the neural network architecture and also in terms of the actual hardware architecture because uh, SNN will be most of the time will be transformed onto the hardware if you want to really utilize the low power or event-driven characteristic of SNN. So it is actually a very multidiscipline approach where you need advancement in neuroscience, cognitive science, hardware, material science to really enable the growth in this area. And last but not least is the application. So in terms of SNN, also neuromorphic computing, really when we talk about all these devices or this group tool, we always want to know like, so what? Are they able to really solve the problems that we have? And when it come into play of applications, you actually determine the new requirements as well as the potential of SNN as well. So it comes in both ways. The fundamental research will lead to better understanding of it. And at the same time, if we apply into a device or a solution, this application could in turn also contribute back to the area of fundamental research as well. So it's a kind of a both way. So that's actually the end of the practical session for today. And uh, I mean the theory session for today. So if you have any questions, do feel free to send in your questions through the chat box in Zoom or even Use the link that Hochi has sent you in the www.wuclap.com and MLDA SNN. So you can actually key your questions there. But right now, we actually participate in a short quiz before we go for a break to kind of consolidate what we have taught in our theory session and kind of make it more fun for you guys. So maybe Hochi to follow up from here. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, can you all can see my screen, right? Yes, you can see it. Okay, okay. So We'll give some time for everyone to come in first. Let's talk about people.
Okay, since um, around 62 people have, are already here, so I'll go and start the quiz. Um, don't worry, it's not graded or anything. You won't count it to your GPA, so just have fun. <laughs> Oh, whoops. I'm sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. But yeah, y'all can select the answers and I'll show the, show the answers later on. Okay, time's up. So I'll show the answers, although you all probably have seen it just now. Um, so the common SNN neuron models are the Isaacovich model, the Hodgkin-Huxley model, and the leaky integrate and fire model, as mentioned earlier. For the next question, what are the differences between traditional neural networks and spiking neural networks? There's a timer here, so y'all got to answer quick. Okay, time's up. So the correct answer is that SNN produce spikes as output while traditional neural networks don't. And both SNNs and traditional NNs make use of weights and biases to alter its input. So the other options are that SNNs cannot use backpropagation at all while traditional neural networks can. But as Tongshan mentioned earlier, there are some variants, backpropagation variants that can be used with spiking neural networks. And for this, We'll, be, we'll actually be using a uh, spiking neural network to implement image classification later on. So this is wrong as well. Right, so we'll be moving on to the next question. Match the neural model with the best description. Okay, time's up. Let, let's show the correct answer. Okay, it looks like most of you most of you managed to match them correctly actually. So the Hodgkin Huxley model is actually the most accurate model of the biological neurons, and it's actually one of the earliest ones. The leaky integrate and fire model is the simplest and most effective model. And it's what we'll be using for the implementation of spiking neuron later. And the Isaacovich model is the a more computationally efficient way to replicate neuron spikes than the Hodgkin-Huxley model, but not as efficient as the leaky and integrate and fire model. Moving on to the next question. What is Moore's law?
Okay, so the correct answer is actually that the num Moore's law refers to the number of transistors on microchips doubling every two years. So, yeah, basically the rest of the answers aren't correct, and this is the only correct answer. Okay, moving on to the next question. The ways that spikes are being encoded are time to first spike, back propagation, spike timing dependent plasticity, and rate of spiking. So this is another multiple choice question. I'm a question with multiple answers. And the two ways that spikes are actually being encoded is time to first spike and rate of spiking. The other two, back propagation and spike timing dependent plasticity, also known as STDP, is are actually methods of optimizing the algorithm, optimizing the spiking neural network. Okay, so on to the last question for today. What is not a component of the LIF or leaky integrate and fire model? This is also another multiple answer question. Okay, so the correct answer, oh, whoops, my bad. This, this is not a multiple answer question. This is actually the, the, only, the only correct answer is this, because they are asking what is not a component of the LIF model. That's my bad. So activation, the activation function is actually only present in the traditional neural network models, such as convolutional neural networks and the multilayer perceptual. And that's it for um, our quiz today. And now we'll be taking taking a break for around 10 minutes until 7.55. And for now, you can go ahead and ask your questions on WooClap and we'll be going through some of the, we'll be reviewing some of the questions and trying our best to answer most of them. So the first question is, does SNN benefit from parallel programming like GPUs? Um, actually, regarding this, right? Um, uh, I'm actually not, I actually think that spiking neural networks will benefit from parallel programming as as with other uh, neural networks, but I'm not very sure on this. Um, could Tongsheng confirm on this? So, hi everyone. So I think we will just answer a few questions for this while some of you are on break. And you can answer more later on in the other Q&A session at the end of the workshop later on. But for this question, in terms of the in terms of the SNN for parallel computing, or parallel programming by GPU, I think parallel programming and GPU is a bit different, but when we talk about SNN, uh, it is beneficial to take note that 
for true neuromorphic computing device and SNN, it's actually asynchronous. So in this case, parallel processing will be very important for SNN because it will actually help a lot with the low power efficiency. Because if we actually take a look at how the neurons are being uh, work, okay, you can see my screen right now. So just now we talk about spikes being produced, right? So this is time, and then we have some spikes that are being produced. So if we actually talk about asynchronous computing, or in this case, it could be parallel in this case, uh, once a spike is being produced, we can actually straight propagate forward into the new network. If you're talking about the TTFS, you know, the time to first spike, or even without encoding, you can actually use this to just propagate forward into the overall neural network and then you'll propagate forward and do something. So if you're talking about asynchronous as well as parallel programming, yes, SNN will really benefit from this. And it is actually one of the key, one of the ways that our biological brain works also is through the you know asynchronous brain. Think about a lot of things at one time, but of course not that efficient to say. But yeah. That's actually how it works. So another question, if another similar question that I'll talk about this will be the sparse and event-driven. You know, that's how we talk about the, as you mentioned, this is a spike that's being produced as well as here and here. So this is actually in terms of time. Time exists, and these are being spikes that are being produced. So if you recall, uh, when we talk about sparse is that see that these spikes only occur at specific time period. I say T1, T2. If you look at a conventional approach, we are having uh, some value, analog value, or they actually can change along the way through time. And this is not sparse because you continuously have that neuron activated throughout the neural network. But on the other hand, for this, if there's an increase, we propagate. So let's say we have another neuron here. This neuron is only activated when this part is being propagated. But it can be deactivated on its own when there's no spikes, and only when there's a spike that's activated. So this is actually a lot more power, energy, uh, you know, low energy consumption if you think about it. And event driven is because when we talk about production of spikes, it will mean that you have to have some certain stimulus that crosses the threshold value and then have this spike that's being produced. So if you think about it, if your stimulus are being passed on like noise, especially if you talk about cameras or audio data, then there's noise that you know you will not kind of cross the threshold, you set a correct a right threshold. And then only if there's actually something that's you know, uh, valuable in our processing, a spike will be produced. So this is what we mean by event driven. So as mentioned, your whole your whole your neural network can be deactivated throughout, but then only when you actually cross a threshold and once a spike is being produced, then you see your neurons start to be working in your neural network. So this is what we meant by sparsity as well as event driven. So how does this enhance output? Really is talking about the efficiency. Right? We want to have a high efficiency and low energy consumption. Yeah. So will the slides be shared? Uh, I think we have shared in the Zoom chat. You can share again the links for the slide as well as the uh, link for the notebook we should we will be using in our practical session. So uh, for other questions, we will leave it for later. But for now, maybe we can you we'll actually start the hands-on session uh, soon. So you can actually faster go for a toilet break or something. So we'll come back and then start the hands-on session at 7.55. So the rest of the question will be, uh, we'll try to answer them later on at the end of the workshop. So yeah, so if you have any further questions, please tap here and we'll try to answer all of them at the end. If not, we'll actually put in some of the answer in Word document and then put it in the additional materials that will be available after you submit the feedback form at the end of the workshop as well.
Okay, now it's uh, 7.55. Uh, we'll be moving on to the, the Google Colab, uh, the hands-on section of our workshop today. So, um, if, if you go into the chat, you can see that um, Songsheng has sent the link for the slides and Google Colab. So you click on the, the link and this will be the first, I uh, click on the Google Colab notebook and you'll be able to access the Google Colab notebook. Um, so the first thing you have to do is because uh, we have locked this notebook, you won't be able to make any changes on, on it unless you make a copy. So first, what you do is to make a copy and save a copy into your drive. And once you've done that, you can change the name of this into whatever you like. So you could remove the copy or you could change it to something, yeah, something nicer. <laughs> Um, and so first of all, um, you don't have to do this, but doing this will increase your, the experience, make the experience better, which is to change the runtime type to that of a GPU. So first, what you do is to click the runtime tab on the top, change runtime type. And if your hardware accelerator is none, change it to the GPU and save it. Um, although they recommend not using it unless you need one, it doesn't cost anything and it's free. So it might as well just use it, right? <laughs> so click save and we can kind of begin now. So the first part of the hands-on activity will be done by me. Um, and we'll be implementing an image classifier with a convolutional neural network. The data set we'll be working with is the MNIST data set. Um, this will be the same data set you work with for the SNN as well. So, yeah. So for the first cell over here, if you can see on your own uh, Colab notebook as well, we are basically trying to import some functions that will be used later on. NumPy for math, matplotlib for plotting some functions, and um, some PyTorch libraries that will be useful later on. Um, if you're not familiar with Jupyter or Google Colab in general, to run the cell and go to the next cell, you um, click Shift Enter and it will, it will run eventually. For the second cell, basically what, what it's trying to do is to connect to a divide uh, GPU if there is one. So if you've run, if you change your runtime, this will change the device you're working with to a GPU or else you'll be working with the CPU, which will make your code run slower. And in the third cell, we are basically, we are initializing the batch size and the data path, data path in which the data set will get run in. So for the next cell, what we are doing is basically for each image, we'll take the image, resize it, change it to grayscale, transform it into a tensor and then uh, normalize the tensor. And we are doing it for both the train train and test data set. Yeah. Uh, I think this will take some time. Oh no, that was quite fast. And we create some data loaders because it will help us later on when we are creating the, it will make it easier for us to work with in the, with the neural network models data. So the next, oh, so the next one, the next cell we are basically taking the first um, 
first data point in our train data set and, and printing it out. So for this image, it's assigned a label, which is five. And you can see that this is actually uh, the digit five. Uh, and yep, so since we've done the setup and preparation, we'll move on to uh, implementing the traditional neural network, in which case would be a convolutional, convolutional neural network. So um, if you are more familiar with TensorFlow, the linear function which I use here is basically the same as a dense layer in TensorFlow. So you can use it the same way. And for those people who don't really know how to implement a convolutional layer, it's actually just um, nn.conf2d with input channel, output channel, kernel size, stripe, and padding. And how, how this class works is that in the init function, we create the layers first without running them and then without running them. Uh, oh, shit, now my... um, so we, we actually first create the layers. I'm not sure why my keyboard isn't working. But we first create the layers without, in it, without running them. And then in the forward, propagation stage, we forward propagate the function value through all the layers that we've created. Um, so the task for you now is to create the, the two convolutional layers based on the instructions given above, which is this. So the things you have to take note of is that the input channel given is one, and that the output channel from the first convolutional layer would have to go into the input channel of the second convolutional layer. So for now, you just have to do these two and I'll give you all a few minutes, like one or two minutes. And after that, you can, I'll continue running the code. Um, actually, um, my keyboard isn't really working now. So I think for, although I would like to show you all how to do this, I think I'll unfortunately have to pass the, this, um, part to Tongsheng. Okay. So yeah, as mentioned by Hochi, uh, I hope that you have had tried this on your own, but we will just show you how it's done. Uh, as well, so that you will not be lost. So in terms of the convolutional layer, as mentioned by Hochi, how you implement it is following this command, where you call the COM2D, since you're using image, it is two-dimensional. And for the first part, we can put input channel, because it is what we have specified in the, as part of the argument, followed by the output channel. In this case, we put 16, but if you want to play around with it, sure, you can try other values as well. And in terms of the kernel stripe and padding, you just follow along, just put five, one, two. 
Then the next one we have to write for the next COM2 layer after your cooling layer. And in this case, we first write in 16 because 16 was the output channel for the previous COM2 layer. Then we put in this case 32 since we want it to be 32 here. And again, similarly for the kernel size try and heading, we put 5, 1, and 2. So these values can be changed. And then you can observe how it affects your output and performance later on. Okay. So once you run this, you should be able to update this. Uh, and then here we actually train and test the neural network. So first you specify what are the loss function and your optimizer you want to use. Since we are using uh, MNIST data dataset, which is multi class classification, we're going to use a cross entropy loss and optimizer, we're going to use Adam. So it can be other optimizer if you want to play with it. And your import number here will be two. Of course, you have increased it, you're going to have a better accuracy, but you're going to take longer to train as well. And after that, we can actually define some of the functions which are going to help us in our training and testing. So over here, the most important one is really not specifically about every line, but the overall idea of what we are doing here is really trying to forward propagate throughout the layer in the network that we have specified. So in this case, you see we here, we put a model and then we tell the model that we're going to train it. And then through the import and through the data set, we're going to inject it into the neural network. We're going to forward from forward uh, propagate the value to get the output and then find the loss and then we bear propagation to minimize the loss. So this actually adjusts the width and this is each step of the optimizer and we can get the how get the accuracy based on the some manipulation of the output because remember it's going to be a some several value but we're going to get a highest probability of which class it belongs to so we're going to use our next. So this is for the training. We're going to do this for multiple epochs. In this case, it's two. And for the test, we're going to run the evaluation of the model and then just run it through the test data set and see what is the performance. So if you run this, you'll actually obtain your, in here, we're going to train it. You can train it and then see that after tra finish training, it's around 97% for its training. And when you test it, it's around 98.42%. And following that, for these two cells, what we are trying to see is really how it looks like in terms of the prediction and actual number. So the prediction in this case is run through your network and see what it predicted. And the actual number is shown over here. So you can compare them and see how, how they differ. And over here is where the see how the each of these values correspond to the data set. You can see here, we put image, see view, and then we just see how all of this look like. So this is actually just the part for the uh, conventional CNN approach. So I'll be going a bit fast, but um, because we all like to move on to the sparking neural network, to compare it to what we have done for this CNN. So to follow along, uh, I'll be going guiding you through the section three in this notebook, which is where we're going to use the spike neural network. So first of all, you have to put this library for SNN Torch. So there are actually various libraries which are being implemented in recent years, with the you know, popularity of SNN more and more popular. So SNN Torch is just one of the many. There are actually other uh, libraries you can use to implement it, but we, in this workshop, we try to use the SNN torch. So you can actually visit the previous links here to get more information about the library. And the other uh, useful libraries will be provided in the additional info, as mentioned, in the additional materials which you'll get after you submit the RCVM form like, as well at the end. So here you import the SNN torch. So similar to what we've done for your PyTorch, we import SNN, and then we import the surrogate as well as SF. So if you recall what we have gone through in the theory lesson is that we're going to use the surrogate gradient to do the optimization 
for the back propagation of a path. So here, the surrogate actually refers to that surrogate gradient function. So for SNN torch, you can actually specify what type of surrogate gradient function you want. So if you look at the documentation, you can actually look at how, what are the types of uh, surrogate function that they have. And uh, you can see which one you want to play around with it. You know, when, when you decide to play around with it. So some of it is herbicide, or you have your sigmoid. So these are actually functions that, as mentioned, is to approximate your values of your, you know, your original discontinuous loss value. Right? So how you do it is that over here, you try to follow along, this one will be very fast. You just type circuit dot plus dot sigmoid, and then you can actually input the slope. So what, how smooth you want to make your, uh, your surrogate function, but here we're just gonna put 25. And so over here, yeah. Oh my God, my spelling is bad. Okay, yeah, it runs. So then we want to define the neural network. So we're gonna use the same architecture as what we have done previously. But in this case, we're going to make it spiky, you know. So you to do so with SNN torch is very simple. If you look at here, you're going to fill in all of this. So I hope you're going to follow along with me. Uh, I'll give you some time also after I explain to really type in your values. So uh, first of all, the LF is what we call the Hickey Integrate and Fire Neuron that we talk about. So for SNN torch to implement your whole neural network into a spiky neural network, you can just add in all this after your convolution, convolutional layers. Just when we have conf two, conf one, and then um, fully connected layer. So we just add this LF after every of these layers. So how you do so is by using this function, SNN wiki, beta, and your spike gradient. So you just Put here uh, and here and here. So the beta, we didn't mention what's beta. Beta actually stems for the decay rate. So just now, if you recall in the slide, we talked about the we talk about this. You see that there's some decay. So this is actually what we are talking about. You know, the beta will actually control the rate of decay. So we actually specify that in here, here from one. 0.9. And when we talk about this, if you look at this again, there's a time step, if you recall, we talk about time step being very important for SNN. You can specify what is the number you want as well. So if you put a larger number of time steps, of course, it's going to take longer to compute. And but at the same time, you could potentially get a better result. But again, it depends on your implementation and how your neural works. But yeah, it's very simple to implement this LF in using SNN torch. So after this, over here, for the, after we have defined the overall architecture, we will define the forward mechanism, forward pass mechanism. In forward pass, you see that it's a lot more complicated than before already. What we want to do is we want to first initialize the neuron by doing so, by doing this one, initiate wiki. And this can be done over here. And this one, I put a hash here. So you have to key in the value. So for mem1, membrane one, stand for the LF1 that we talk about. So similarly, we're gonna put here for n of d two, here three. So here is how you initialize it. So we will just give like 10 seconds for you to tap in these two before I go on. So hope that you have followed along so far. If you have any questions or difficulty, do feel free to write in the chat box and we'll get to you, okay? We'll help you make sure that uh, you don't get too back behind. Yeah. So I hope that you have done this. Uh, 
Now we we'll actually move on to do the after that. So after we initialize the hidden states and your output for each, what it does is that this function will define what it's going to do in your power propagation. So if you remember, uh, we're going to record here is initialize some array to record the final layer. So we have the SPK tree, which is stands for the spiking record, and map tree is a membrane voltage. So for each of the time step, so here again, let's say we're gonna this one will be a good example. We're gonna we specify 10 time step and gonna see how many how, how does spike being produced in these time steps. So you're gonna do a loop whereby you see whether a spike will be produced at each of the time steps. Right. So how you do after that, you what you do at each time set is first you get curl one. So what is curl one? It actually is the current. So in this case, we are not uh, converting our data into the spiking form as mentioned before. We are not encoding it. You can actually do still use the SNN by using them in the form of current. So this is what we are doing here. All right. Uh, and to do the current will actually be equal to the using uh, output from your first layer. So after your convolution layer and your pooling layer, you'll get the output as the current. You're going to inject it into the LF1 here. So how we do so is that we use this self dot. So we uh, call this here. So again, you're going to write in what is the number. So this one will be one, one, and one because it's the first one, right? First LF1, current one, we're going to inject it in your memory voltage. What is the initial memory voltage we initialize here? So this is set here. So actually, it's very repetitive. After that, you just copy and do the same thing, you know, but you just change it to two here, change it to two, and here will be two, and last but not least, here will be three. For the third, now So, until here, if you have any questions, do feel free to write in the in the chat box, and we will answer you. Okay. And then you can run this. And you see that we output your model and it's similar architecture to what we have, but then now with your LF. Now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to put your optimizer as Atom, just with several other different parameters, and your, you're going to use cross entropy as well. Right here. And then your import number, we're going to do the same. We're going to use two so that we can do a comparison. And over here, So we're gonna run here. What we're doing is that we're gonna look at how it looks like the shape of your data. Ninety six is the batch size of your last batch, and it's a one channel, twenty eight by twenty eight. Okay, so hope y'all can follow me so far. Now. You can actually then train the SNN over here. So we're gonna be doing what we have done just now as well. But for SNN, because we are using in the form of spice, there are some minor adjustments we want to put. So if you remember here, network data. So here we have for each epoch, you're gonna convert it to tensor and use your device to accelerate it if possible. In this case, you're using GPU, so it's fine. We're gonna invoke the data into the network. So here we put network, we set it as straight, and then we call your data onto the network. 
and then you will obtain your spike and momentary as mentioned just now. Then you will actually be we'll actually be moving on to the next one, which is to obtain your loss value, calculated loss. So similar to what we have done just now, we call your loss and compare it with your actual value. Here. Yeah, so here we have called your loss and then we do the same thing. You can do back propagation as we did just now. And then you then your, your update your loss history and then over here we're just gonna create it so that we can have a basic sensing of whether it's going right or wrong. And here we're gonna get the accuracy. So just now remember we import a library, uh, one of the module is uh, SF. So SF is useful because it can help us get this. It can help us get this accuracy rate. So this will convert your spikes into the value and compare it to the targets, okay? Because if you can do so on your own, now, to be honest, you can go and look at how your spike is being, but then, uh, whether it's optimized or whether it's efficient is another thing. So you can just use what is provided in the library. If you want to just do a simple one, right? And then you can calculate your accuracy. So similar to what we have done for your tree, we're going to do the same thing for your testing. And a predicted value can be done in. So here we use a target. Again, so the same thing. We call the data and then we do the test because data which is now in the test data loader and you can get a predicted value by using this command so this is a spike if you recall spiking record and then we sum it up and next one so yeah see you see you can actually use this later on to compare it and get your accuracy also if you want to do it manually like what your SF accuracy rate is doing yeah so that you do your loss we are just finding the loss to have a basic idea of what a loss is but if you if you're doing testing you technically don't really need this but it's just to kind of see how it works right so after you do you get trained and yeah that is actually how it works so while we are waiting uh, i think we can answer some of the questions that were being asked just now as well so uh, i think one of the questions was very relevant to this particular session which is SNN training process very slow. How long does it usually take? So I think you can do the comparison right now in this session and you can see how fast or how slow it takes. But uh, I think one thing you must remember is that the implementation really, really play a part in how fast your training is. But overall and generally, Speaking, if you are talking about trading right now, it is slower than uh, typical ANN. You can observe here also. Due to this implementation, and also at the same time, if you look at here, we're gonna we are talking about a lot of previous parts that have been done, and you have this kind of uh, record array that is recording your values. And it's going through the time step as well, you know. With uh, if we if what we are doing for your SNM, we're having some time steps. So, uh, it's gonna lead to your computational time, and that will actually lead it slower than what is done. But again, if you how about we said just now in terms of your parallel computing and asynchronous computing. It is hopefully that in the future we have some libraries that could do so asynchronous uh, evaluation and training. And you kind of will be able to realize the potential of your, uh, your SNN already, right? So I think, yeah. And if that's for these two questions, so if you, if you if Tess doesn't answer your question, you can let me know also. Uh, I think Kochi has also answered some of the question for how is SNM better than ANN? Yeah, as he mentioned, not really, but 
you know, like, like it's closer to the human brain, but little bit is better because I mean, the, the term better actually depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about accuracy only, then no, sorry, right now, SNN is not better than ENN at all. And uh, but if you talk about efficiency, uh, and if you want the property of event driven and sparsity as mentioned just now, then SNN is going to be better. So the metrics of performance really depends on the application as mentioned the tier, uh, just now as well. Really it depends on what we are looking at. Yeah. And it is hopeful in the future to really reach uh, efficient implementation that is very comparable to ANN as well. That's the research that's still ongoing right now. And the answer, what is the significance of neuromorphic data set as compared to the traditional one? Uh, SNN give uh, event-driven, yeah, it's, it's just spikes. And because if we are talking about SNN, of course, if you want to be a biologically possible, you're going to use a, a spiking neuromorphic data set. But this actually relates to another question, which is the relationship between the SNN and event camera. So what do we mean by event camera? So there are actually products like the event-driven camera. So what it does is that only when there are actually a movement in the scene, it, the camera will capture the scene. So at its core behind it, the sensors that's uh, behind this kind of event-driven camera actually uses some neuromorphic uh, hardware and SNN sometimes, whereby we're talking about spikes. Because when we recall, if you recall just now when we talk about only when the stimulus is high enough, there's a spike. So when there's movement, the movement actually create, just in this example, is just for movement camera, movement event driven camera. Movement will actually causes your spikes to occur. And that will actually be captured for the camera. And these spikes can be converted into, can be recorded down. You know, like a camera, you can always take picture and save it. You can record these spikes and use these spikes as a neuromorphic data set to train it or evaluate it. So if you're talking about training, training wise, you train already, you can use whatever people have done up the neuromorphic data set. And then for testing, you're gonna connect your event uh, driven camera to your SNN, then it's gonna work. That's how you how it, how it is. I think there's one popular question also, which is uh this one, the viable significance of black box. Okay, so this is more relatable to explainable AI, right? Really, and it is not coming from a point of, purely from a point of algorithm, it really is the responsibility of the designer as well as the architect to make sure that the AI is understandable. So how do we go about is really having a sound fundamentals of what is happening at a fundamental level of your neural network and then trying to observe what is happening at each layer to really understand what's going on in your AI or your solution because if not, it's going to be a black box as you mentioned. And same for SNM, it is just a, it, it could be comparable to that of a typical neural network and you want to explain it, you, you may have to ensure that you understand what's going on at each layer. So in this case, it could be the LRF layers. You can look at what are the spikes that are being produced. And then based on the data and the spikes, do some analysis, understand why the spikes are being produced in this manner, such that you understand what is happening with your algorithm. Yeah, so I hope that answered the question. So I think that is for this one has been answered also. What are resources to keep in touch with latest development in deep learning and also SNN? So these two are with a uh, repeated question also. Uh, in the additional materials, <laughs> there'll be some links for you. You can look at uh, some of the links for your, to understand, learn more about SNN. But at the same time, for uh, if you want to learn, learn to learn more about deep learning, you can join us in more MLDA workshops <laughs> and events. But other than that, uh, you can always uh, search some of the good websites like you know towards data science and they have a lot of free uh, materials available for you so you can use those to understand more about deep learning and also if you're more interested you can always 
look into you can take up some causes in NTU, I guess, and catch up. But some newsletter online also. I think those are useful, but to be honest, sometimes I don't have the time to read. But yeah, you can use those to catch up with the latest trend. What's the career pr prospect of AI? I'm gonna speed this up because we are nearly running out of time. Uh, career prospect wise, AI in Singapore is doing investing in a lot. As you can see, we have so many companies. All of these companies are in Singapore, except for this one. This is in, except for this, but every, every one of them are in Singapore. So uh, there's new investment in FinTech also using AI. So it is a growing field and you're gonna get a lot of careers which are related to it, such as AI engineer, algorithm engineer, and so on and so forth. Is SNN still early in research area or are they really for getting that development? Uh, unfortunately, now the focus is still research oriented. Industry-wise, more needs to be done. So in one of the additional materials, so I'm going to show you what you can expect. Uh, so over here, if you run finish, you can see that it is slightly lower than the ANN. Yeah, back to this again. But, you know, this is what is to be expected for SNN. Yeah, so if you, you can play around with the parameters and see how to change. Uh, in terms of the materials, I'm going to show you the materials which is here. Ah, okay. here. So here we have some links for you to visit to understand more about SNN. And uh, here actually is a report that is written by Accenture. And it has some of the, it goes off what we have mentioned also, but also coming from a more of an industrial standpoint and where neuromorphic computing and SNN actually plays a part in the future in the industry. So you can take a look at this uh, and you know figure out and see whether you want to do it, whatever projects you are looking at. And last but not least, is SNN quite hardware dependent? Yes. Uh, yes and no. As you can see, we can we can implement SNN here. It's fine, perfectly fine, sure. But if you want to realize the full potential of SNN, you will need the neuromorphic hardware. And what are we talking about this? Uh, talking about circuits which are built for SNN. So just now we mentioned about surrogate gradient, why we use surrogate gradient. Recently there's a research that's just done where they're able to use surrogate gradient to minimize the errors when we use analog computing devices. Well, what's the difference? Why we use analog devices? When we talk about some of the chips that are being produced, they are digital right now, but if you talk about the brain, it is both in a mixed signal kind of standpoint. Uh, mixed signal is useful in a sense that you can do asynchronous very well and you could have a lot of energy saving. And it's also how we perceive data from the real world. So if you want to use a full-on neuromorphic hardware, the goal, the dream, it's always a mixed signal or analog neuromorphic device with SNN as its core. And that will be low energy and very, very similar to how the biological brain works. Yeah. And I think there's one more question. Let's faster go through. What is the same for this one? Can I say surrogate gradient optimization need to be performed for cooperation besides SGD? Is it it is always more perceived? Yeah, if you think if you if you think about it, you, you, you're gonna if you use surrogate gradient, you're gonna always have that circuit being implemented as well. So it's an additional computation. And that's why we say that the goal is, the end goal of research is really to achieve STDP. And boom, we're gonna have like a, really like a, like a artificial brain. And then it leads to ethics question, but we'll not discuss that in this workshop. But yeah, uh, it's gonna be low power and very adaptable and efficient. So I hope that answers all your questions. So if you have any questions, do feel free to drop us an email in the site that's been produced or drop me a drop, uh, yeah, or just find drop me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, but now we would like to invite you to help us do the feedback form so that we can learn better for what we have done right and what we have done wrong so that we could create better workshops for you to learn more as well. So yeah. Go fill in this workshop and uh, feedback form, and then you at the end of the feedback form, you will get the link for 
the additional resources I mentioned here. So maybe can send also, he, he sent the link onto the Zoom chat. So just click on the link, help us do the feedback form, and then you will have this access to your to the additional resources, which you can play around with it, uh, and we'll see whether it's helpful or not. If not, just drop me an email, then we can discuss further. Yeah. Hope you have enjoyed this session. That's actually the end of today's workshop. So do fill out the survey once again, and once you are done with the survey and you have no more questions, do feel free to exit the Zoom session and have a great night ahead. Thanks for coming.